Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, brought to you by the experts at Maryfield Garden Center. Join us as we discover beautiful plants, new trends, and exciting ideas for your landscape. So let's get growing together. Maryfield's Gardening Advisor, bringing out the best in your garden. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. It's a going to be a great weekend. It's a had some some really nice weather lately. Exactly, we've been pretty lucky with the cycle. You know, heats up during the week I and know. then beautiful weekends. I know we've had some rain here or there, kind of heavy at times, but you know, little bits here and there. So we have a great show for you today because we're talking about color. I mean, you all, you think about color in the spring, but. People may not think about as much color in the summer, but there's still a lot of color out there. Exactly. It really is out there. I mean, you're, you're exactly correct. You know, we coming out of the wintertime, we love that spring right. color, but the focus today, of course, we are in the throes of summer. But there's a lot of um, shrubs, particularly, we'll be talking about, mm -hmm. perennials, and of course, annuals are in full bloom. And so if you come into the garden center, you'll be amazed at all the beautiful flowering plants that we have. We continue to restock all, mm -hmm. all year long. Uh, and like I said, so today we're just going to go through and highlight an assortment of, I, I can't say some of the best, it's just some of the ones Your that favorites, I chose Your favorites, the ones you're looking off. at, right? Right, yeah. exactly. But, <laughs> uh, so yeah, we'll be talking all about, you know, crepe myrtles, hydrangeas, you know, some uh, coneflower mm -hmm. and a couple new plants are introduced to sort right. of an assorted bag of beautiful plants uh, to brighten up your garden right now. All right. And we will be taking your phone calls later on the show, so be sure to stay tuned for that. Uh, before we get started, just a couple quick announcements. Um, our tent sale is going strong at all three Maryfield Garden Center locations, so we hope you'll come by. You get some great bargains on. There's some plants, there's some Christmas items, there's home decor, there's gardening tools and kotchkis and, and that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, I've been going through cleaning out some of the sprinklers at our store and everything. <laughs> They've been selling fast, but at, at half price, why not? That's right. Well, it's a, anywhere from 50 to 75% off and more, so it's it's great. So take advantage of that. That'll, it'll go on for a few more weeks, but every day changes a little bit because yeah. we keep stocking. So take advantage. I wanted to mention too, you know, we, of course we're a live show. You know that we're, we're a live show, but we go through, especially today, we've got a lot of plants to show you. And so if you're, if, you know, if you can't quite get them down as quickly as you'd like, you can always go back to our website, maryfieldgardencenter.com, because you can find all of our shows archived on there. You'll find both the, the shows itself and kind of our outline, we call it, kind of our, the way we, you know, we're not scripted, but kind of what we try to follow. Yeah, and I use that as a teaching tool oftentimes if mm -hmm. I have customers at the plant clinic and they want guidance on pruning, for example, I'll show them, well, go back to this episode mm -hmm. and you can watch it in detail That's or something. Or if you have questions about your lawn, you know, I'll say, well, you can see it in detail in this episode. Right. So it's a good resource to have. That's right. And if you, you know, if you have any questions, be sure to call. You know, we do the, the end of the, the show, we'll do questions here. But if you can't get through, call the store anytime. I mean, you all at the plant clinics are always there to help. Yes, all three locations. All three locations. So, so let's get going. All right. Well, I brought a few pictures in, just kind of start the conversation mm -hmm. off. And I just want to say, as far as summer color goes, you know, you really can with good planning, good plant selection, uh, you can can create a uh, landscape that has interest in all four seasons of the year. Uh, this is down at Green Springs, Green Spring Gardens Park, that's Fairfax County Park. I was going to say I'd be a lovely home, but I, I had a feeling, you know. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, you could do this, I mean, you know, if you have a little bit of property or something, create this nice vista right. that's there, you know, with the gazebo in there, adds mm -hmm. a, a focal point. But of course, it's framed with lots of color, you know, not just the green of the shrubs, but, you know, things like the crepe myrtle, which is uh, in full bloom right now, the black eyed Susans that are in there, the coneflower. Uh, and this is one of the things I think they do so nicely at these gardens is they show you these different plants and combinations mm -hmm. and ways that you really can add beautiful color throughout the season. Now, in the next picture that's showing up also is just loaded up with lots of bright color but you'll see it's foliage color. Right. Uh, and this is something we've talked about several times on the show, but uh, in the heat of summer, these tropicals just take off. You know, we really do have tropical summers, and when we have these temperatures in the 80s and 90s and the frequent rain showers, it's warm, it's hot, it's moist. I mean, these tropical plants just grow by the day out there. I know. So you can see things like ginger and sweet potato vine and the um, elf and ears in there. 
but they've done a nice job also mixing annuals and this is the thing that annuals of course provide color all summer long and way in the background you'll see the hydrangeas that we'll talk about in more detail now this picture was taken down at the campus of american university in northwest D uh, washington dc and one of the things i do is i serve on the education committee of the northern virginia nursery and landscape association uh, your father has a, been a past president, your brother's been a past right. president, mm -hmm. so as a business, uh, this is our professional association and we strongly support them. Right. So each year, uh, the Nursery and Landscape Association, the Grounds Management Society, the local cooperative extension offices, we get together and we co-host or support this uh, field day. Right. So that's next Thursday. Mm -hmm. Uh, Green Industry Professional Field Day. It is open to everybody. It's open to any anybody that wants mm -hmm. to attend, though it is a professional event. So all the topics and the presentations are kind of industry geared to the industry, yeah. geared to the mm -hmm. industry specifically. Uh, there's sessions both in English and in Spanish That's great. that are available. Mm -hmm. And this is not a classroom experience. This is out in the field, hands on, hands -on mm -hmm. because American University, I use photographs from there all the time because they they are a arboretum designated mm -hmm. as a public educational arboretum beautiful campus and you have an opportunity to really um, get that sort of right. touchy-feely experience yeah. there and you can see greenindustryseminar.org you can get all the information exactly mm -hmm. so if you want to register you know check out the agenda the full schedule go there are you, uh, are you teaching a session there? I'm going to be there. No, okay. I'm not teaching any sessions okay. this week, but um, I'll be there as a volunteer. Right. And also, Come this is part of my continuing education mm -hmm. as well, where I get to keep up to date on what's going on in the industry. Great. Great. So, yeah, okay. I'll be there and hope to see you there as well. Stop by and say hi if you can make it out All there. Right. All right. That's couple next more. Thursday. A couple more pictures. Back to summer color. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is really just kind of sort of whet your appetite, right. so to speak. You know, it's not just the beautiful flowers and foliage that's out there. But of course, it's um, attractive to all the pollinators and the butterflies. Now, this is a tropical milkweed, I want to point out in there, which means it's not winter hardy here, but that's where you get those really vibrant colors and they'll reseed themselves. Uh, so butterflies, bees are out, which are hugely critical mm -hmm. as far as um, beneficial insects right. in our landscape. So we'll just go through these next couple pictures here pretty quickly. Uh, this is salvia. Again, not, it's hard to get that really nice blue coloration mm -hmm. in there. You can see the bumblebee at work. Of course, they go in there after the nectar and gathering the pollen and, and fertilizing all the plants and flowers in the process. Hummingbirds are out. Um, oh, and yes. so again, wow, that is quite a shot. That is, as one of our customers took that mm. picture. I'd like to say that was my photograph, <laughs> but that would be a story. That is very um, cool. So we can put hummingbird feeders out, but it's also, it's really the flowers that attract them. And so this is the importance of having flowers blooming throughout the entire season. And I thought that was a hummingbird moth. Mm -hmm. So that was a moth pretending to be a hummingbird <laughs> feeding at the butterfly bush. So that's the thing. Just Great. add all this color. You'll enjoy it. The birds, the bees, the butterflies enjoy it. Just um, life is better with flowers. That's right. So stay tuned. We've got lots of suggestions for you. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Maryfield's Gardening Advisor. We're so glad you could join us on this beautiful Saturday. Looking forward to the weekend. Yeah. And like I said, we're talking about color in the garden, uh, summer mm -hmm. color in the garden. And so that, of course, leads us into a conversation with crepe myrtles. Right. Yeah, because ah, really spectacular. there's... Spectacular. You know, they give us so much color, so much beautiful color right. for and such for a, a long, long period time. of time. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, you know, crepe myrtles, I guess, really started blooming about one or two weeks ago, but some of these will continue flowering right up into September. There's early, mid-season, late varieties, and then they finish that up with beautiful fall color. That's right. So they offer us so much in the landscape. I think if we could um, go back just one picture there, I wanted to say the nice thing with um, crepe myrtles is their versatility in the landscape. Uh, where they can be used as a specimen plant. And this, again, is it down at the um, campus of American mm -hmm. University. And, you know, this is a picture I took, I think, last July. I mean, so you can get this type of color right now at this time of year, and you can see that 
the crepe myrtle here is a um, intermediate size. You know, it's sort of been elevated up into right. more of a tree form that's there. And I love that color combination there with the vinca planted under it. And again, in the background, the hydrangeas, you know, uh, black eyed Susans back there. Right. So again, they're just masters of um, adding this color. And a lot of it's because during the summer months, um, Families were out visiting campuses, mm -hmm. trying to figure out That's where right. they're going to be sending their uh, children, and so they want to look good all year round. Well, and we are so lucky around here to have all these public places to be able to, to see these beautiful Oh, plants. yes, absolutely. And so I, I promote them a lot because mm -hmm. I enjoy going out right. to visit too and learn. So that's crepe myrtle there growing as a specimen. And then you'll see in this next picture where we've got crepe myrtle where it's been uh, planted together sort of in a mass in this it's large like a grouping. Nice hedge. <laughs> yeah, and this is, hedge is a good word because what they had done with these, uh, and you've seen this where crepe myrtles are pruned differently. These they went down and, and sort of um, severely cut them back to their to the same height okay. so that they all kind of re-sprout, fill back out, and give that very dramatic sort of hedge-like appearance. Uh, so they're tough, they're durable, and this is low maintenance, give you a lot of color. This is sort of entrance into a housing development of uh, not far from where I live. So again, you can apply these ideas to your home as well. So crepe myrtles, they can be tree form, they can be uh, sort of this intermediate form, and there's so many varieties that have developed. This next one is a variety, it's called Pokemoke. This has not been pruned or sheared in any way. That's its sort of natural shape. They'll maintain this really tight, uh, dense, tight ball of color that's in there. It's just starting to come into bloom in pink. And further back there with the white flowers, you can see that's a variety called Natchez that's in there. Now, Pokemoke is just one of uh, several, and it's going to grow to be, oh, maybe at most four feet tall, four feet wide. Mm -hmm. So I just like to put out how versatile this group of plants is. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing I'll say is crepe myrtles, they are sun loving, uh, heat loving plants. You know, so really I want to see crepe myrtle get at least six hours of direct sun. Sometimes if you put them in partial sun, where maybe they're only getting four hours of sun, something like that, you'll get where they grow, but they get thin, they get leggy, their blooming doesn't grow, right. produce that well. <clears throat> so that's really the only requirement that we have for them is give them as much sun as they possibly can. Uh, a lot of them were damaged this winter, but during the cold, severe the wet, but for the most part, they're uh, making a good strong comeback that's in there. And then the other one I'll show you is a variety, it's called Natchez. Uh, I think this shows where if you are looking for a medium-sized tree, Natchez is one of the larger varieties. It can grow to be 25, 30 feet tall. But in this townhouse setting, uh, I think it works very well as a tree and it just mm -hmm. continues to sort of raise the canopy on here. So we can go anywhere from tree form to little shrub forms. They can be used in containers, uh, they can use in gardens large and small. Lots of bloom season, like I said, tough, durable, and easy to care for. Very versatile. And I love, that's a nice inviting little corner there. <laughs> it is, again, I'll say that's down at the Green Spring Gardens Park where they have a little demonstration trying to show what you can do ah. with a small garden, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in, uh, staged as a townhouse backyard. Now the, um, the thing is, this is such a popular plant, and they've been so extensively hybridized and developed to try to give us the full range of colors, sizes, and shapes. You know, it really gets to be kind of overwhelming as right. far as, you know, you come in and you see all the different varieties to choose from and work with. Well, one of the things that happened, I think it's interesting, and, and you see this in the next picture, is for a long time, for many years, one of the missing elements was red. Right. We okay. had this, you know, we had pinks, Pink. we had white, mm -hmm. we had lavenders, we had all these colors, but red seemed to be absent. So uh, Dr. Whitcomb out at Oklahoma State University, he undertook an extensive breeding program, and his objective, uh, along with just evaluating developing good crepe myrtles, uh, was to try to search out and get a true red color. Mm -hmm. So for, it's been a few years now, but probably four or five years ago, uh, we had the introduction of some really true red colors, things like Red Rocket, Dynamite. Uh, these are both, like I said, developed by Dr. Whitcomb out at Oklahoma State University. And I just looking on the map and realized, well, they're in the same climate zone as we are here okay. in Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I feel really okay. good about, mm -hmm. you know, hey, crepe myrtles were developed under, you know, similar growing conditions what we have here. Now, the other is really 
even preceding Dr. Whitcomb's work was extensive breeding programs done at the U.S. National Arboretum right here in Washington, D.C. Again, just talking like you'd mentioned earlier, how fortunate we are to have these oh, kind yes. of resources right in our own backyard. So U.S. National Arboretum, they were really the ones, the first ones to begin hybridizing uh, the Lagers tremia indica with Lagers tremomia forii. These are the Asian and the species and hybridizing them and selecting for good cold hardiness uh, for crepe myrtles in our climate. So we've got these wonderful selections that are available to us now. And I brought one more in just as an example of one that's called Cherry Dazzle sitting here on this set. This is a compact form that's going to be maybe four foot by four foot, uh, may, maybe spread out a little bit wider than that. And this was developed down University of Georgia by Dr. Michael Durr. So oh, okay. mm -hmm. the selection just keeps expanding and if you come into the garden center you'll find all these and more available right now. Now like I said they are tough, durable, easy to grow plants. Of you know, they, they give them just sort of normal watering and care at the time of planting. Right. Uh, but once they get established, they're quite drought tolerant. Now, on occasion, uh, the some of the pests that go with them is we can get mildew, and with the humidity and the warmth that we have in our climate here, mildew is uh, a nuisance. It doesn't kill plants, but it can get in the flowers and cause them to get moldy looking. Uh, we can get aphids and we can get Japanese beetles are out right now bothering mm -hmm. them as well. Right. So if that becomes an issue for you, these I was going to say are a couple of options we have regarding control. Uh, the neem oil that you can see there, this neem oil works for both the, the mildew, the aphids and the beetles. It's an organic option or this one from Bayer, the three-in-one insect disease and mite control, again, helps with mildew aphids and Japanese right. beetle, but it's the uh, chemical option. So okay. if those problems show up, that's a choice that you have. Okay, you had one more picture to show before we get right. to break. And I don't have time to do justice for this, but I wanted to put out, um, show you this Vitex, because one thing that happens, crepe myrtle, for all its wonderful attributes and popularity, you know, they, they tend to almost get overused. Well, to me, Vitex, this is a, an alternative. Its growth characteristics, growth requirements are very similar to a crepe myrtle. You have that versatility of a large shrub. Uh, you can prune it back and keep it a little bit smaller and limiting its sizes. It comes sort of in this uh, purple-violet color, or you can get it in a white color. Uh, but it's basically managed the same as a crepe myrtle, used right. the same way as a crepe myrtle, but I like to give some options there. That's right. Okay, we're going to take a quick break and come back with some more color for your summer garden. Besides annuals, as you're seeing there, another plant that just screams summer to me is hydrangea. Oh, yes, it sure does. Mm -hmm. And they are out there in full bloom right now. Now, the thing, of course, with um, hydrangeas, there's, we really, we sell at least about five different species or groups right. of hydrangeas. We're only going to have time to talk about three of them mm -hmm. uh, briefly this morning. And there's lots of choices in each one of those. There are. <laughs> but the, um, what we call big leaf uh, hydrangea or hydrangea macrophylla, it's the one that's best known to people. Now, the thing is, they, um, they, they took a beating this winter. These are the hydrangeas yes. that have the big puffball flowers on. They're either blue or pink. Mm -hmm. uh, but what happens, a lot of these varieties, a lot of these big leaf hydrangeas, they flower off of wood that was produced the previous season. So what that means is the branches that grew last year are the branches that are flowering this year. Now, because of the severity of our winter, a lot of those those branches got killed off. The top part of the plant got killed off, but they're regenerating, regrowing from the root system. Mm -hmm. So don't be surprised if, you're, if your hydrangeas are not flowering this summer. Uh, it's kind of take this as a, a renewal process. The plants are coming Growing back. Year. They're looking beautiful, but you may not see the blooms uh, this summer. Now, this is a a newer variety, there's a whole series of these that are called City Line, and they've got names like Venice and Rio and uh, ah. so on, Berlin. But what these uh, hydrangeas have that sort of distinguishes them from some of the others is they tend to be very compact and dense with strong stems on them. 
because one of the things that happens with these hydrangeas, uh, they, they can get kind of big and floppy, a little bit leggy that's in there. And like I said, sometimes the pruning on them is a challenge because you have this little dilemma uh, with interrupting their flowering. Right. So the city line, and we carry several of these at the garden center, this is a series that's been introduced to stay compact and dense with um, a little bit less demand on the pruning. Uh, just try and give you sort of an idea, again, the, the diversity of selection that's out there. This next one, it's the same species of plant, uh, but it's showing what's called a lace cap flower head. If the previous one that's that big puff ball we call a mop head or, or hortensia type, this we refer to as a lace cap. Because what happens is in the center, those little small flowers, those are actually the true flowers uh, that are in there. But then surrounding it is a circle of sterile blossoms, which have the larger showier bracts. So it just it's, it's fun to be able to have different forms right. of these. You know, I just don't have the space in my garden, but I've seen some people are sort of really hydrangea collectors, and I'm so envious <laughs> when you can get the variety of colors that are out there and the right. flower forms and everything. You know, it's just one's just as pretty as the other, and they just start complementing each other. And then we get some really bizarre things going on. Uh, mm. Which I like. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I really, <laughs> right. you know, sometimes, you know, difference not always better That's or right. prettier. But in this one, I just love this as one appropriately named pistachio, which you know has that pink and uh, chartreuse color showing up in there. There's um, hydrangeas that have variegated leaves, hydrangeas that have yellow leaves. Uh, the list goes on. Now these hydrangeas, I want to say, this group of them, they are really shade plants. Um, if you put them out in the full sun, you know, they, they kind of struggle along out there. Right. You know, they, they wilt during the heat of the day. You know, their blossoms don't last as long. So to me, the ideal location for this is sort of a morning sun. Let's say where they get that early morning sun that might be hitting them at 9, 10 o'clock in the morning. But by noontime, I really hope that they're in the shade right. type of thing. It's sort of the perfect environment. So they'll go for anywhere from a bright shade to a, sort of that part sun, part shade, which is ideal for them. You can put them in the full sun, but then they uh, struggle along a little bit. And sometimes I just mention this a little bit because at our garden center is looking at, we don't necessarily have the shade provision right, for them. Right. So I think it's a plant that gets even better and better uh, with time when as gets, you can put it, it in that, a home. Right, and <laughs> put in that right environment that's right. out there. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, I didn't have time to put in here, but there's a whole series of these that are called the Endless Summer series. And what's different about them is they are repeat bloomers because all the hydrangeas that I was showing here, you know, they kind of have that, um, they, they flower in July, maybe into August, and that's it. But the Endless Summer ones, you can deadhead and prune them, and they keep coming back for you. Now, hydrangea paniculata, the panicle hydrangea that you're seeing here, this is the toughest, most durable, uh, to me, maybe the most reliable of all the hydrangeas. It's a sun lover, so it wants to be in the exact opposite sort of um, environment. It grows out there in the full sun. A lot of these can get quite large. You know, it's not unusual to see them go eight, 10 feet tall. Uh, July, August time period, you know, really that late summer is their bloom period. You can treat these like you would a crepe myrtle. It flowers on new wood, so if the plant is getting too big in the late winter, you can go in, prune them back aggressively, and then they come back and reflower like this. Mm -hmm. Again, lots of varieties in there. Uh, I'm not sure of the name on this one, but the next one is a very popular variety. It's called Limelight. Uh, which goes from that white to chartreuse green. And there's even this great star, which has these larger flowers in it. And I brought one into the studio uh, to show you. It's a new introduction that, that really kind of caught my eye. This is one that, you know, if I was going to go out and buy one, I'd probably be looking at this one that's called um, Quickfire. Quickfire blooms a little bit earlier in the season, so they're flowering now in July. And it starts out a perfectly sort of snow white coloration, but then that flower pretty quickly migrates over to this sort of nice pink color. So you get a little bit of that color variation in there as well. Great. Okay, we've got one more type that can. I'll do this quick, super quick, quick talk even though it break. deserves more attention. I but know. the next one we look at is variety. It's been around forever, so you probably know it. It's called Annabelle. 
Um, Annabelle is a variety of our native uh, hydrangea. It's one that was selected specifically one for more, the really big flowers, big snowball, white puffball flowers on there. And we'll see that coming up in the next photograph of Annabelle. Mm -hmm. It's one, again, <laughs> you can treat it like the panicle hydrangea. You can prune them back aggressively in winter. They flush back out and give you this flower. So extremely uh, reliable hydrangea. Mm. And I think we're going to take a little break right there because when we come back, our next picture will be a good lead into okay. some of our other Sounds summer flowering good. trees. All right. We'll, take, we'll be right back. Stay tuned. has a nice picture there of a flowering vine, yes. summer blooming vine. Now that's a, a, a hybrid <laughs> form of a trumpet creeper that not too many are familiar with. I saw it for my first time last year. Mm. We plant at the garden center and they have just been fabulous, just taken off and in full bloom right now. Oh, that's great. And that, that dramatic kind of orangey color. Mm -hmm. So we have that available as well, flowering vines right. for the summer so garden. So many choices, so many choices. You've got a few more. Yes. So let's go back oh, to our that's pictures. Picture. Yep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. We'll go back to our pictures. I forgot we were where we left off. talking about hydrangea, off. and this has the Annabelle in it, but even yeah. more. Yeah. But this is nice because it shows Annabelle in a landscape setting. Mm -hmm. Well, if we let's see, Oops. we're ahead one. Let's go back just one picture, and there we there go. There we go. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I like I chose this because here uh, we have a nice collection of plants. Again, this is down at River Farm, the American Horticulture Society. But right in the center, that really um, stark white flower, mm -hmm. that's the Annabelle hydrangea. But immediately behind it is the oak leaf hydrangea, which is probably my favorite of all, but I didn't have time. I knew I didn't have time to talk right. about it, so <laughs> I didn't just did, took it out of our slide set. Uh, you can see a little tree in there that's a sour wood. And also then the large flowering shrub back there, the bottle brush buckeye. One of the things I love about this is these are all native plants. Uh, the oak leaf hydrangea, the bottle brush buckeye, the Annabelle hydrangea, mm -hmm. they're, they're varieties or cultivars of native plants, but uh, that's where their origin lies. So again, the bottle brush buckeye, you don't see it used that often in landscapes around here, in part because it does get uh, quite large. It does well in this kind of woodsy environment that you say, see here, uh, where it gets ample moisture and is a little bit sheltered from uh, extreme heat and drought conditions. But they give us really large um, panicle flowers there. You know, those, they can be you know, 10, 12, 14 inches mm -hmm. long. Uh, as they go into their bloom period. So again, we've got beautiful native oh, plants yeah. to add that summer what color. What a great place to sit. You see, it's kind of hidden by the by the inset, but there's a bench there, and you know, just what a yeah, exactly. How inviting is oh, that? Wow. Yeah. And again, <laughs> cool I, I water. Credits plant. to Lewis Ginter Botanical right. Gardens. Go down and, and visit them with that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I I wish that was my backyard. I'd like to take credit <laughs> for that, but that's just not the truth. Uh, and also, there are some summer flowering trees, uh, not a huge amount. Um, you know, we've got things like the golden rain tree that's in bloom, but this is a, one of our native uh, summer bloomers. This is sourwood uh, or oxydendron. This is a really value. You can see it's in bloom right there, the little white bell-shaped flowers. It's classified in the same family along with azaleas and rhododendrons and blueberries. And if you look at that blossom, it looks like a little bit of a blueberry flower. Mm -hmm. yeah. Highly valued for its honey because uh, it's uh, out there for the bees that are foraging. And just a little side note because I, I just thought of it. But you know, we have this uh, collaborative relationship with George Mason right. University, and they've placed some beehives out at our Fair Oaks location. And I'm just loving as I go through and I see all the honeybees that are yes. active throughout the garden wow. center and collecting all that nectar and back there and making their honey uh, and doing good things there. But you'll see them uh, going to the sour wood, which is really the flowers are of secondary importance. Uh, one of the main reasons people use this is the fall color on this is really oh, dramatic. Yeah. You see that in the next shot, I believe. Right. 
So I'm getting a little yes. bit ahead of myself oh. in the seasons, but I wanted everybody to see that some all these plants uh, that we're showing, they do give a lot of versatility and interest throughout the year. Mm -hmm. So the sourwood, it's kind of a slow grower, so it's not the most popular landscape tree. Mm -hmm. uh, they can sometimes, you know, they like that nice woodsy soil, treat them like you would an azalea rhododendron, uh, and have a little patience with them, and they can come along and be a beautiful specimen. Right, now daylilies. Right, I'm going to jump over to the perennial daylilies. section yep. now because it's, it is trees and shrubs, but the perennials are really what's adding a mm -hmm. lot of dramatic color in there. Daylilies, um, you know, really late June, July is a peak time. They're easily hybridized, so there's this huge selection of just give you an idea of what's out there. Uh, with daylilies, be, through the hybridization and everything, one of the things that they started doing, there's a lot that are called tetrapoids. These are the ones that personally are my favorite that I go to because they have larger, showier blossoms. And I just couple I took examples of. This Francis of Assisi uh, is just one I took, uh, I think I took his picture on Tuesday out in our perennial Gorgeous. section because they're getting close to a true red, you know, mm -hmm. that's not as, to me it's got mm -hmm. still a little bit of that magenta in there, but you know, the, these tetrapoids, I, I call them, the blossoms are bigger, showier, the plants are a little more robust, they seem to hold up longer, and even though the flower itself may only last for a single day, they produce enough buds to give you at least a good two, three, sometimes even four weeks of color at midsummer that's, that's in there. Great. So of course one of the things that happens, we're always looking to, you know, extend the bloom season. So for, for many years now, there's starting with Stella Deora, there have been repeat bloomers. A lot of these uh, repeat bloomers, the flowers are smaller, the plants are a little smaller, but they're more prolific in their blooming and they can give you extended color really starting in late June and continue all the way through to the end of summer. And that's just one example right there, the red hot returns. So you've got a range of colors that comes out there. Uh, another one, uh, the echinacea or the coneflower is just absolutely you know, a favorite of mine. It's been ridiculous the number of varieties that are out there. I've, I've, I've brought all these different colors in to show you, right. but we were just running out of time. <laughs> But just my point is, hey, there's all kinds of different colors oh, nice. and heights and sizes for you out there. Now, uh, I was thinking this is just like with, if you're, you know, dogs, like they have Labradoodles and, mm -hmm. you know, Puggles and all these, you know, where they're mixing different that breeds together. Cool. This is a Ekebekia, right, wow. where they've taken cone flowers and Rubekia and hybridized them. So, you know, our selection, our palette of colors and plants that we can use for summer color just continues to grow and That's continues great. to develop. Well, and these new varieties and, and new collaborations are, are great. We were talking about something a couple weeks ago where there were you know, two things put together, so it's yeah. super. So we just keep bringing them in. We keep learning and keep sharing with you and um, just love bringing all this new stuff to That's you. That's right. Well, if you have any questions, give us a call, 703-387-1046. We're going to take a quick break and come back, and we'd love to talk to you. Stay tuned. So if you have any questions, give us a call. Uh, while we're waiting for a, a phone call or two, you had really wanted to show a couple of these. Oh, good, good, because yeah. I got to bring them in. We were talking about yep. the cone flowers and all the varieties of color that are out there. Well, you know, picture's worth a thousand words. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just brought these in as an example. They're really some of the first people to start out with this, where this big sky series and several right. have come along. Mm -hmm. So this is one that's, uh, what's the name on there? They just Sunrise. Call it Sunrise. Mm -hmm. uh, so, the, right, the traditional, and get this purple cone flower, it's really a, a little, pink oh, there we go, color. There we go. Mm -hmm. But um, this one, like I say, they developed and got some of the yellows in there. Uh, I'm just going to reach across here and grab. I thought this was interesting. Then we went to town and started developing different flower forms. Uh, this sort of what I call poodle type. Oh my goodness, how did I get a big old weed growing in there? 
<laughs> Quick, get TV, that out there. Right. You didn't see that, everybody. No. Um, but <laughs> then the love of live TV. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but this one, you know, where the uh, what we call the the disc flowers kind of are enlarged, kind of gives it that sort of poodle type of look right. that's in there. Uh, so. One I'll more just show we one do. more, okay? Because I got so. about a half dozen here. I, I could keep going. <laughs> really uh, this is one they these. called Tiki Torch, uh, which and really caught my eye. Isn't that a bright, vibrant color that's coming, in there? Coming, 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 oh, coming. If there I can get myself out of the way, yes. <laughs> okay, oh, that's but that's cool. Tiki Torch. Yeah. But you can see this is a big, tall plant. Yeah. So All right. they have different heights and sizes good. as well. Well, good, good. Okay, our first caller is Diane, who's calling from Washington, D.C. Hi, Diane, how are you? Hello. Hello. Uh, good morning. What can we do for you this morning? Where, who am I? Who did I call? This is the uh, Maryfield's Gardening. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry, but this is not Diane, so I'm, I'm just confused. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. That's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Who is this? I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Diane's on the phone now, on the TV now. Um, I'm Terry. Terry. Hi, Terry. Mm -hmm. How are Hi. you? I'm good, thank you. Mm -hmm. And what is your question about? Where, well, my question going? is about hydrangeas, since they were talking about them. Okay, um, yes. I just, do you want to know the whole thing? Sure. Okay. Um, I have a, I have two, I have a bunch of hydrangeas, but I have two small, small ones that were given to us when my mother passed away. Hmm. So, and I made sure that they came from a garden that, uh, where they could go in and they would grow. Because I know when you order things from a floor, sometimes they don't grow all the time. Exactly. So I asked her to get it from a, from a garden center that it would, you know, take on so that we could keep them. They keep coming back every year, but they haven't gotten any larger. And so they're just these little kind of pot-sized things. Right. And, but they come every year. And last year, I think there was a tiny flower on one of them, and this year there's nothing. So I don't know if that's because of the bad winter. Um, I'm glad that they survived, but should I just abandon that and get re get other ones, or do, I, do they stand a chance? They they're green, they come back, but they're really little. Well, here's here's a couple ideas I have. There are small varieties of hydrangea. There's varieties like Pia, and there's a pink elf, and they will stay small and compact. But still, you might say small. They normally go, you know, might be uh, three feet tall, three feet wide, or or something mm -hmm. in that size. Yeah. Uh, so, but they are they're generally pretty reliable as far as um, flowering. Okay. If these are you know, so if, if you have one of those small varieties, I'm going to say you can be successful in the garden. I am suspect, even though you went through the trouble of, of selecting or requesting plants that you could grow in your garden, it's possible that you may have still gotten some what I'll call greenhouse hydrangeas that, mm -hmm. you know, are just not performing well for you. Now, how long did you say you've had them in there? I've had them four years. Okay, and you only... And they never change. They come up every year. Yeah. And so I'm but are they getting killed back to the ground each year and then recovering when you say they come back each year? Yes, they go. They almost okay. go away yeah, in the then, winter. But, you know, they, I can still see the little stalks because they're next to two bigger. Right. So that's, that's just not going to work for you, Terry, because what's happening is the, like I said, the stems that grow mm -hmm. this year flower next year okay. but if each winter that's getting killed back to the ground then you you really don't have any opportunity to for this plant to mature to a flowering size okay. so the one that you have is clearly it's been four years it's not winter hardy enough to really perform well in in our climate mm -hmm. so I think um, we've had some mild winters we had some cold winters but for over four years this gets killed back each year it's just not working for you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a cold hardy variety and it's time to abandon that. But you can come in and purchase some of these dwarf compact varieties that are much more reliable in our climate. Okay. Thanks so much, Okay. Terry. All right. Well, thank you. Thanks have, for the call. Have a All great right, week. Bye-bye. Okay. Uh, we are going to, I think we're going to need to take a quick break and then as soon as we come back, we're going to talk to Dee, calling from Greenbelt. So hang on, Dee. We'll be right back with you. Stay tuned. Okay.
flies by, so we've got a couple more callers. We'd like to get to as many as we can. Dee is calling from Greenbelt. Hi, Dee. Dee, are you there? I'm here. Hello. Yeah, How are good you? Good morning. Good. How are you this morning? Great. Oh, just great. How can we help you? Hi. I didn't plant any vegetables yet. Why is that? <laughs> the rains uh, for the past month or so, I've noticed Don't be me. that oh. all of the water has just just set in one spot and it's just soaked and that's the normal space where I do plant and so now I'm trying to decide should I get a some dirt and fill it up and then try to plant something or is it too late to plant any well, vegetables tomatoes cucumbers um, well, let me tell you, it's, it's late to be planting summer crops, but we can definitely be talking to you about planting some fall vegetables. Uh, the only summer crop that you might have success with would be something like green beans right now. But my question is, now you've used this area before, why is it, why is it holding water now? I mean, is this a low spot where the water collects, or did it settle in, or why is the water collecting there? We built we built a fence around that area, uh, and when we built the fence, it seems like the water, there was an area where the water would just right. flow and go through to the next, point, to the neighbor's yard, and it would just continue to build up right there. And it seems as if maybe they're not cutting their grass the way they used to, where um, it okay. lets the water stand on sure. this side of the fence and so it doesn't go all the way through. And plus we're on a slope. I mean, we're on a yeah. downward where the okay, streets D, go I'm, down. Yeah, let me, let me say it's because um, we're living on time. Is First thing that you need to do is correct that drainage problem. I'm not exactly sure how you're going to do that. You're going to need to investigate this whole situation, the fence, because we need to allow that water to flow through. But your fall vegetables, the time to be planting those is really late August. So everything from broccoli and cabbage and cauliflower and kale and Swiss chard and spinach and garlic and there's a ton of things uh, that we can start planting as early as late August. So what I would say is over the next few weeks, um, get this drainage thing straightened out. Uh, it seems like you've got pretty good grasp on that. <laughs> and then towards late August, uh, we'll be getting our fall vegetable plants in, and that's a good time to get ready for the next season of gardening. Great. But I think uh, planting tomatoes and such at this time of year, it's not, not going to really produce much for you. Oh, okay. Thanks yeah. so much next. for the phone okay. call. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, our next caller is Lisa, who's calling from Indian Head. Do you have a quick question, Lisa? Hey, good morning. Good I love morning. your show. Thank oh, you. thank you. I have the same similar question to the caller number one. It's about the hydrangeas. They're probably about 12, 13 years old. I transplanted them two years ago. They're not the big leafy kind. They're the small leaf ones, but they're not. They have never bloomed since I transplanted yeah. them. Now, when when they do flower, does this get a white flower, or is it kind of the pink or the blue? I mean, what color is the blossom? There are seven different varieties, and I've forgotten the varieties. There are different colors. Okay, different colors. But when did you transplant them? Two years ago, and I haven't had a flower since yeah. then. And were, were they pruned back or cut back at that time when you transplanted them? Yes, I did. <laughs> yeah, they'll 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 recover. They're gonna they will resume flying for you. I'm gonna predict next year. I think there's a couple things. You know, when they when they get pruned back or like this winter, if they get killed back, sometimes these older varieties can take a year or two before they resume flowering. So it's just gonna have to be a little bit patient with them. Uh, I if if you don't see any buds forming now, it's probably not gonna happen this year. But Provided um, we get a, a reasonable winter, don't prune them, don't cut them. I'm just say, just kind of keep your hands off them uh, for now, and then I think next summer you'll get some flowers. If you want to put a little bit of bloom booster or super phosphate on there, that's fine. But my guess is that you'll get flowers even if you just leave them alone. Okay. Yeah, and Thank it's just the, so it's much. it's the transplanting, the pruning, the winter. It's just those things that happen. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure I hadn't done anything to 
actually hurt them. No, but I do want to mention, like Tom, out that's one of the reasons these um, like endless summer varieties, mm -hmm. where peat bloomers are so popular and dominating a lot of the landscape, because they will grow back and bloom that right. same summer. Right. Have a wonderful weekend. Okay, let's see. Our next caller is Carol, who's calling from Springfield. Hi, Carol. Hi. Hi. We're really short on time. Do you have a quick question? Yes. I have uh, three or f uh, three uh, a large crepe myrtle, and my question is, how uh, do I have to prune them? They're about uh, 10, 15 years old, and I don't feed them, but they bloom profusely, and they're the size of a one-story house. Right. And they have a lot of... Uh, you know, from year to year in the winter, they have old spent balloons on them. Uh, tree trimmers come through and want to hack them, you know, down, and I'm sort of scared. Right. But uh, do, do I have to prune them, or should I just let them grow? No, you don't have to prune them. It's totally your choice, Carol, and just how you want that plant to grow. So let me say, if you want to prune them, and they don't, it's not required, but let's say if they were getting too large or you chose you wanted to shape them, the best time to do that is kind of in late February, March time period. But the plants do not require pruning. It would only be for your purposes if you decide, hey, they are getting a little bit large or something like that. Uh, and then I would prefer that you talk to a qualified arborist, a certified arborist, so they can prune them correctly and maintain some of the natural form and shape of them. But uh, they respond well to pruning, but it's really your call. Great. All right. Thank you so much for the call. Okay. Well, I apologize to Karen and, and Donna. We, we don't have to. I know Karen's question was on bagworms. She was calling from Fredericksburg and uh, Frederick, Maryland. Sorry. And bag, bag, yeah, well, bagworms, bagworms could be out right now. Okay. I haven't really seen them at the plant clinic, but they do emerge out in June, July. These are the caterpillars that uh, make those little cocoons that look like a pine cone. Right. And if that's out there, Captain Jack's dead bug is a very good organic control for that. Super. Thank you. Thank you so much for all these great ideas for summer color. It's nice to have the phone calls again. It's I know, been a while. I know, it's fun. Next week, uh, James is going to be on with Peggy on Water Gardens. So James White, so that's going to be great. So yeah. hope you'll stay tuned for that. We hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week. And uh, David, you're going to be leaving here and going right to the garden center. So stop Absolutely. by and see him. I'll be there at the plant clinic. Okay. So come see me. Have a great week. Bye bye.